Hi, Trevor. Thank you so much for joining us today. Um, okay. As many may say, you are a professional passive investor or a limited partner. Um, so we're going to jump into more questions to learn about your investment portfolio, but wanted to uh, introduce yourself to the audience. Sure. So my name is Trevor. I'm based in Austin, Texas. I've been passive investing for about five years now, um, originally from Canada, but uh, like the warmer weather down here. Wow, that's amazing. So in Austin, Austin has been pretty, pretty hot, right? Very trendy market. Austin a lot of is else. crazy. So this will be one of the best times for me to actually own a piece of real estate in my house, which is like almost tripled in value since I've moved into it. So I'm, I, I, I'm quite happy uh, with how Austin's going. <laughs> Any plans to sell your home and then uh, the uh, returns you are all of the money you make from that you'll invest it in syndications or you're not at this point. Not at, I still need a place to live. So that's very true. Um, so yes, I wanted to learn more about your first uh, syndication deal. So for many who are on the fence about investing or they um, aren't too sure what the process is like, how did you find your first real estate syndication to invest in? Yeah, so I, I started going to what I call the weekend seminars where people promoted about joining a mentorship program. And I joined the local mentorship program. I don't want to mention the name because I don't recommend anybody joins it, but that's how I started my education. Um, they're really good in the single family space, not so good in the multifamily space, which is where I wanted to go. And so, but I started getting educated there, which was great because it gave me a place to start. And then shortly after I joined, I started passively investing. Um, and sadly, but my first couple of deals didn't do so well, but I've done much better now that I'm a little more educated and can look at deals. And, uh, you know, I think they just had a little bit of bad luck, but I didn't lose any money. So that's important for everybody to know. Um, but it uh, would have been nicer if it, you know, but I've been in deals since then and I've done very well on. Uh, in terms of, not the deals the first couple of deals how you join a local meetup um yeah. was there anything specific in terms of the meetup that persuaded you to take action because i know i've gone to several I, I can go to several conferences and just you know be on the sidelines and not actively yeah. invest in a deal so yeah. what was the switch so what what appealed to me the most and still does i'm still part of the group and i still am active with meeting people what appealed to me is they were their motto was Texas inv Texans investing in Texas. And mm -hmm. so I like that concept that, you know, I would invest in Texas where I live so I could go look at things I invested. They had regular meetups and so I could attend the meetups and connect with people that were, were either sponsoring the deals or also investing in the deals. So I felt like I was joining a network that was local. Um, a lot of, lot of the syndication groups or whatever, you know, they're, they're national and you know everything is done by remote or over coach where this was just everything was here you know and they're mostly investing in central texas where i live and so i still do that and i still connect with a lot of people that are in the group and you know so it was the people that attracted me more than anything got it and then from there you mentioned that that's where you met the sponsors for your first deal that's correct. Yes, that was where I met the sponsors for my first deal. And I met lots of people that were doing deals. Um, I actually invested five times through the people that I met at that group. Um, I still have two of them active. Um, two of them went full cycle. And unfortunately, like I mentioned, did not pay any dividends, but we got our money back. The other one did, did pay me everything it promised. And so that was good. And that was here in Austin. It did get challenges during COVID as a lot of places did, but uh, um, it was a successful investment. And then since then, I've joined a couple of other mentor programs just to broaden my horizon. But again, most of the ones I'm in are specific to Texas market. You know, they're very active in Texas because that's where I'm most active. I think um, a trend I've seen or what the common thought process is, if you want to be a GP, you will join a mentorship group, right? Yes. But you as an LP continue to join um, mentorship groups. Can you talk a little bit about that? Yeah. So even as an LP, you need to get some education, right? There's, mm -hmm. You need to understand. And the more educated I became, the better it was that I could check and analyze deals. And so, you know, it's one thing just to say, okay, I'm going to give my money to somebody I know, like, and trust, which is paramount, right? That's the number one thing. 
But if you don't understand the basics of a deal, if you haven't spent some time educating yourself, which everybody should do, and there are ways to do it without joining a program, um, you can you can get better. And there are programs that just do um, training for passive investors. And a lot of the mentorship programs, they have different levels. And some levels are just access to deals that are done within the group. And again, that gives you the, the credibility of knowing, okay, these deals are following the group's you know, trained practices. So it makes it a little safer. Got it. That makes sense. I think it came up in the call I just had about education is, you know, LPs need to understand the numbers as well. Right? Yeah. So the, again, the most important thing is who you're giving your money to, but you still need to study them, right? Like my first investment I did with what I'm going to call strangers that I hadn't personally met yet. I actually stalked them for about a year and I went to every webinar they held. I went to every, you know, and they asked, uh, offered training on asset manager, which I was very interested in becoming eventually. And so I spent a lot of energy getting to know them, their personalities, their, their, you know, what drives them because I wanted to invest with people that were in line with my interests as well. And then of course, while I did that, I learned some of the things, you know, I'm going to call it the key points that a passive investor needs to, to you don't need to know how to underwrite a deal but you need to know how to read what what they're saying and is it realistic and practical in terms of realistic and practical what are the key points give our yeah, audience so, so everybody talks about we're going to buy this property and we're going to fix up the units or we're going to increase the rents and so you quickly can look at rents in the area just by going on on apartments.com and look at the comps and what are their rents and then you can go to other government websites and see what the income of the area is, right? You should look at a three mile radius. It's amazing, unless people change job, they tend to live in the same three to five mile radius and just move around a little bit. So if they're saying, okay, we're gonna bump the rents up to here, but the people living in that market don't make enough money to support and pay those rents, um, the plan is flawed. You know, if they say, okay, everybody else is charging a thousand dollars and we're at six fifty, so there's three hundred and fifty dollar delta. Look at and are they comparing it to like properties? And you can tell a little bit on apartments.com just by ratings and Google and just see, okay, could this property actually achieve that thousand dollar rent? You know, look on that property looks a lot nicer. Look at the nice reviews on it. How are we gonna get there? Um, because sometimes people I don't want to say they fudge it, but they pick properties that make their assumptions look good. Hmm. So numbers are fudgeable, essentially. Yeah, I mean, everything, right? An Excel spreadsheet can be made to say anything. And so you just want to make sure that their assumptions are realistic, right? So do people in the area make enough money? And so just think about it, a third of their income, right? So mm -hmm. so if, if you make $30,000 a year, you can't afford a $1,000 a month rent, right? You just can't it's 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 more than a third of your income and but if you make forty five thousand dollars a year you can afford that and mm -hmm. so you can and you can easily find those on uh, city.com or and just get the basic um you know so you want to make sure that you understand those parameters and of course if you can drive and see the property um which is why i wanted to invest in texas right i i always tried to drive a property and the first investment i made i didn't drive the property and then when i got to the property i was like oh this is way worse than i thought it was oh no um, you know um it, and and like it was it was definitely like it looked good in the pictures but when i went there in person it was like wow this place is really run down <laughs> At least you didn't lose money. The number one rule of investing, right? Yeah. Don't lose your initial. Yeah, investment. and I don't want to leave a negative thing. So one of my last investments, three times my money in twenty months. So there's money to be made in real estate, right? That that's a little bit of a phenomenon. Don't expect the three times your money in twenty months. Um, average investor should look at about doubling their money in five years. Um, maybe a little tighter in the next couple of years, but on average, that's about right. Thank you for those pointers. Um, when you started investing in multifamily, did you come from a landlording background? Did you have a small rental portfolio? What was your background like before you started? Yeah, so nothing to do with real estate other than I worked for a business, I fly indoor skydiving, and I, at the very beginning, I helped pick locations. 
and then I opened up the tunnels in the different locations. So I knew a lot about how important location and where you were within, you know, so even within an area, right? Um, what people really got to understand when they're looking at their properties, you know, across the highway can be completely different than this side of the highway. You know, you heard the wrong side of the tracks. Well, that can happen in real estate, right? That this area is nice, but the other side of the highway is not so nice. Um, so you want to make sure you're also looking at those things. But uh, so I didn't, other than I had friends that were involved in real estate, um, the only education before I joined my first mentoring was reading Rich Dad, Poor Dad. Um, and to be honest, I read it and didn't do anything for almost 20 years. And what a mistake. Um, if I can give anybody any advice, don't wait to buy real estate, buy real estate and wait. Um, if I just started when I was your age, um, I'd be a lot wealthier man today than I am. I did, did okay, but um, real estate is a true way to grow your worth. And a lot of people don't think that through. I don't mind if you, you mind if I give you a little example. Please go ahead. So if you have fifty thousand, let's say let's start with a hundred thousand dollars to make the math good. So you have a hundred thousand dollars, and in five years you double it. You have two hundred thousand dollars. You reinvest it all in five more years. You have four hundred thousand dollars. You reinvest it all, and five years later you have eight hundred thousand dollars. You invest it for five years, and it doubles. You have one point six million dollars. You invest that again, you have $3.2 million. So think of that, that's crazy. That's the effect of compound, compound of your money. And so, you know, at your age, that is very achievable by the time you get to my age, that your initial $100,000 is worth millions. Um, and a lot of people don't think that way. You know, they, they don't think that way. And so it's the power of compound interest, the compounding of your money. And Warren Buffett talks a lot about this, right? Um, mm -hmm. That it's very important to let your money grow and work for you. And what a lot of people do is say, okay, well, I made $100,000, now I'm gonna go buy a new nice car. Uh, no, at the beginning, don't do that. You know, drink coffee out of a thermos, not Starbucks. Sorry, Starbucks, I love Starbucks, but uh, you know, keep it as a treat, you know, and take your money and reinvest it. And that's the power of passive investing. Um, right. Your money works for you, not you work for your money. And it's a huge difference because you can only work so many hours. You can only get so much. And yes, people have great jobs and make good money. But where you really, all the wealthy people, 90% of millionaires were created through real estate. Well, I did hear that. 90% were created through real estate. Um, and even people that aren't known for real estate own a lot of real estate. Warren Buffett owns a lot of real estate. Um, he takes the money he makes and he invests it in real estate. That's amazing. It's very true. So I guess for a lot of young people who are, you know, towards the late twenties, thirties, thinking about buying their, you know, home or building a rental portfolio, what would you say to them in terms of do this, don't do that? Yeah. So, so find some way for your money to work for you. Right. So if, if I was very young and starting again, you know, I would start by renting my bedrooms, right? House hacking. And then I would take the money I made by house hacking and I would buy a duplex. Then I would take the money I bought a duplex and I would buy a fourplex. Then I would take that money, and, you know, because that's one way you can grow your wealth, right? Because it's really hard when you're young and you're basically just making enough money. So you right. need to use your energy. Then once you get some wealth, then you use the wealth to make the money, right? So the other one is just other people paying your bills, other people paying your mortgage, but it still builds, right? And then you take that money and then now without your efforts, that's what passive investing is, right? Without your efforts, you give your money to somebody else. They do all the work so you can sleep, you can do anything you want. Got another really good story, a lot of people. So think of it this way. The people that run the syndication deal, they're the airline. So they have the pilots and the mechanics and the crew. You as a passive investor, you buy a ticket on the ride. And so you buy a ticket on the flight. So you pay your money. When you sit on the plane, you can work, you can sleep, you can read a book, you can do anything you want while you're there, right? You don't have to do anything to get to your destination other than put your seatbelt on when they tell you to or, you know, follow the basic rules. And then when you arrive in your destination, they got you there. Passive investing is the very same thing, right? 
find people you would trust, right? Don't get on airplanes that look rickety with crews that aren't taking care of them. Same with syndicators. And then when you're there, you can continue having your job. You can continue raising your family. You can do all the things you need to do, but you get to your destination and someone else does all the work. That's truly what passive investing is. This transitions to my next question. So I hear that LPs turn into GPs, GPs turn into LPs. For yes. you, you have stuck to being a passive investor. Why has that worked so well for you? Yeah, so I am actually switching to GP now. Oh, uh, nice, so congratulations. Yeah, so, uh, and in fact, I'm using your portal and I love it. So we'll do that on another interview. Um, but but yeah, so I am switching. And part of the reason why I'm switching is during COVID, I lost my job and I had another, I had a really good job with iFly and I was really doing well and I was passively investing in real estate. And my ultimate goal was always to, to retire and transition into being active. And I just, I was sort of staring off the cliff of going into active and somebody pushed me off the cliff with COVID. And so I switched gears. At my age, I just didn't want to go get another W-2 job. And I needed, still I needed some income coming in that you collect from acquisition fees, asset management fees. I still had energy to use to create some wealth based on a deal by partnering with passive investors and borrowing the money. So, so, so I did make that switch. But I was quite happy, and even though it was always my plan to make the switch, um, I was very happy just be. And I plan to continue to be a passive investor, and then I'm going to work backwards after I've been active for a while to go back to being 100% passive investor. So I'm kind of, and I always had this plan that I was going to use passive investing to build my wealth. Then I was going to use that wealth and and my time to grow that pile of money, and then I was going to switch back to passive and and then let my wealth grow that way um and then you know they always say you can't escape death and taxes well you actually can escape it so i'm going to take all of my money eventually i'm going to 1031 exchange it into land and i'm going to be walgreens cvs um starbucks landlord and then i'm going to die and my kids will inherit all the land value at a stepped up value tax rate Wow. A lot of people don't know that. So, and again, it's not the biggest return on your money, but it's, you don't have to do hey, it's super anything, right? Like, um, and you know, and so that will, that's my estate planning. So that those, that, that dirt will provide income for my family after I'm gone. Wow. That is amazing. Your kids <laughs> are, are they in real estate? They're not. No, they think I'm crazy. My daughter's starting to come around and keeps wanting me to get an Airbnb business with her, but uh, it's not a market I understand, um, but it it, it is uh, definitely made a lot of people money. Yeah, same with my dad. I think um, he's always been in real estate and never really thought about joining him or learning more about real estate until when the pandemic hit. So I think the kids always come around at some point and get more yeah. interested. Yeah. Um, I do have a few lightning round questions. Um, so first question, what is your advice? The number one concise terse advice to L, uh, potential LPs on their I first can Buy real estate and wait, don't wait to buy real estate. It's a good one. Um, and then in terms of lightning round questions, so you have to fill in the rest of the sentence. Okay. The first one is syndications work because syndications work because you make money while you sleep they, it, it's you and you're buying a real asset that is people need homes i'm a long answer right but it, oh, you're, buying, you're providing something that people need people need homes in multifamily. um strange enough we've got a lot of junk that people need storage right who would think that we need to pay money to store our junk that we never look at or use but we do um, that's what happens and so real estate has a real tangible value that always appreciates and and so that that's definitely why the biggest bs i've heard about syndications is so the biggest bs is to be honest it's it's on the active side you know you syndicate a deal and you just lay in a beach and you drink pina coladas and money rolls in for your investors it's a real work you want a syndicator that's going to work hard to protect your money um so again that it's not for a passive as much as that is for an active but and that is one of the biggest fallacies in terms of the gp side right that they're yeah. so let's do on the lp side lp side a lot of people talk about you're going to save money on cost segregation 
What they don't tell you is you're only going to save money on your passive income. Now that's fine, right? So that hundred thousand dollars we talked about that you're going to double, if you use cost segregation, you're not going to pay taxes on your passive earnings because of the cost segregation. But they tell a lot of people that it'll be just like on active side where you'll be able to use it on all of your income. So it's not, it's only on your passive income. Unless you're a real estate professional. Then That's you can correct, which means income. you have to be full-time and not have a job. Right. Um, if I had to change anything about my LP investments, it would be? So it, I guess it would be that I got educated earlier. You know, because my first few deals didn't do all that well, and I'm learning a lot. And 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 my more recent investments are are much better because I've learned how to kind of do the do the check. Education first, and the last two questions. So, the best book for passive investors to read is is Passive Investing by James Kamasami. It's awesome. And, and I have a YouTube channel and I promote it there. So you can go visit there. But uh, it is by far the best book. Every passive investor should read it. Thank you. And the last one is sponsors that do X are the ones I trust the most. That tell the truth, that are honest and genuine. Um, everybody looks good on the Internet and on Facebook and LinkedIn and all those things. I want people to talk about their struggles. Mm. Do you think that the investor community is into upfront or ca candid in terms of the challenges so, they've experienced? So definitely there are people that only tell everybody the good stuff, right? And right. I want somebody that, that again, I want to learn while I'm investing too, right? I want to understand, okay, so we were a little slow at turning the units. This is why, and this is what we've done to fix it. Okay, I like to know that stuff, right? Because that helps me be a better investor later on, right? What challenges did we have so I can ask intelligent questions? Um, you know, because that's super important to, to know all those things. I guess since you're switching over to GP side, now you can provide that to your investors, knowing, you know, since you're switching the role and you can provide more insight in terms of what that's my about. goal. And I'm always still going to be a passive investor. I still think that I need to practice what I preach, right? So even though I invest in my own deals, I still want to invest in other people's deals because I know I'll I'll learn things. Um, because I can, and I'm more diversified in my passive. So I've got retail, storage, medical, single family home fund, apartment to condo conversion, some land deals. So all of those deals are on the passive side, so that I can learn something about those spaces. And I and you know everybody talks about diversifying your money. Well, diversifying your money to me is that those investing in a couple of asset classes as well, and then not everything in Texas. So I have um, one in Carolinas, one in Arizona, and another one in South Carolina. So North and South, I have investments. Wow! So all on the Sun Belt state. That's correct. So <laughs> again, you didn't ask the question, but invest your money in landlord business friendly states do not invest your money where they're not landlord friendly and they're not business friendly um it's much easier to make money in landlord and business friendly states is it easier to raise money in non-landlord friendly states like new york and california it's <laughs> so it's there's more money there from people but people that live there and make all that money should invest outside of their their areas. It doesn't mean that you can't make money. There are people buying real estate in California every day, and there are people making money in real estate every day. I just like to invest in a place that the, the odds aren't stacked against you, and you have to be smart or lucky. Um, and again, California and New York, massive acceleration, right? So if you bought many years ago, um, you just made money surely by being there, but it was hard work. Right. No, that, that makes a lot of sense. Yeah, New York, not the most landlord friendly. Um, no. There's always like posts on like, how do I kick my tenants out that are not paying rent? And evictions are two to three year process, even longer yeah. in New York. Yeah. Definitely agree with what you said, invest in landlord friendly states. Um, those are the questions I have. Any last comments, last uh, advice, anything you want to share um, with our audience? Yeah, so the most important thing is get to know the sponsors before you you give them your money. Just get to know them a little bit better. Um, you know, be able to talk to them, ask them some questions, 
And if people aren't willing to talk to you or answer questions, they're not deserving of you giving them your hard-earned money. You work super hard to earn enough money to put into a deal. You want to give that deal to somebody that, in theory, treats your money even better than you would treat it or they would treat their own money. Um, very important that you want to give your money to a sponsor that is is just accessible, wants to talk to you, wants to, uh, and offers education, offers things along with what, what they're doing, right? Right. Oh, that's amazing. That's great. Uh, that's a great advice. You want to uh, invest with someone who's transparent, honest, yeah. available, um, and is there for you. Because once you, you know, provide those returns, then, you know, you have a lifelong investor for the next deal. Yeah, yeah. And then just check references. Like, they'll give you references, but they're only, I never give references to people that don't like me. Um, you know, nobody does that, right? Even the most honest person. So just try to wiggle down and say, well, is there somebody you would, um, that would like to talk to? Um, and you'll always be able to figure it out if you put a little bit of energy into it. Yeah, everything exists on their internet itself. A little bit more digging, you'll yeah. find anything you can possibly need. There's a whole universe in, in, on the there internet. Is, yeah. <laughs> well, thank you so much, Trevor. I um, thank you so much for your time and everything you've shared with us today. I'm going to stop the recording.